buddy from the buddy from Daddy's coming over, so we're gonna. Alright, alright, we'll get rolling. Welcome back to HBP, the podcast that covers college basketball and the NBA draft inside and out. I am Rich Harris, and thank you for joining us again today. I'm joined by the Bay Area bomber Drew Barton, uh, who is all fired up for tonight's WCC championships, having a friend over, and all kinds of good stuff. Um, I just I just want to say quickly. I know we want to we want to get rolling today, but um, everybody's on the road uh, this week. Uh, I am going to the Big East tournament, and then I am going to the um, Ivy League tournament. Um, I will not see the championship for either because I'd like to get home and watch some other basketball uh, before we fill out our brackets. Um, Jake is already. <laughs> He saw it this morning. He's in Brooklyn at the uh, A-10 tournament. I know he's going to join me at the Big East tournament. I don't know if he's going to Columbia. Uh, going to see me. I don't know if we're going to see each other at the Ivy League tournament. And then you are going on the road to Oregon, I believe. Yes, I'm heading up to Oregon for the first round of the NAI Women's National Tournament. Our women, uh, we got a five seed. Um, we don't have to. We got. Outside of the hosting school is one of the most generous travel plans, at least for the first round. It's an hour and 45-minute flight for us, not very far. So uh, we have a nice path to the Sweet 16, and we finished the year number 23 in the nation. So um, I, I think uh, the girls are have a, have a good chance to get to the Sweet 16. And as, as everyone knows, once you kind of get down there, anything can happen. Yeah, I, I actually think – I actually think – the elite eight is kind of like the the make or break point because at least in the in the D1 tournament, because a lot of teams can get to the sweet 16 just because like the big seed in their region got knocked out. You know, right, like Florida right. Atlantic had Purdue go down. Yeah. So I think but it's then winning that sweet 16 game is kind of the are you for real? However, yes. I, I don't remember who Florida Atlantic played this week. Princeton. I think they Princeton. played Princeton, so they they, yep. they got a double break because Princeton knocked off Arizona. Yeah, <laughs> do I if do I have that right? Do yeah, Princeton right? not Princeton beat Arizona for sure. Yeah, but but Purdue was a one seed. Arizona was two. So was it two? Yeah. So that can't be right. Well, anyway, though, the, Florida Atlantic didn't play a killer of a team in the Sweet Sixteen. Probably not until they faced down Creighton in the Elite Eight. That was right. That was right. the that was their first big test, and that was that game literally went down to free throws. Right. Yeah. And then they yeah. hit a buzzer beater, or no? Then uh, San Diego State. But yeah, that was an interesting tournament last year. Yes. Where a lot of like small brands and made this a big year, push. And this year, I think it's going to be crazier. Oh, um, it's going to be so. These insane. conference tournaments are even getting crazy, but I'm jumping ahead of myself. So let's <laughs> let's open up the college notebook. You know, last week we focused on who we thought were going to win the awards. A, a handful had been handed out, but now yeah. we have the majority of them. Not all, but we have the majority of them. Uh, and I'll read off, you know, some of them. And if you have any comments, I, I don't think there's any surprises here. I don't think there's one player of a conference. We talked well. Actually, we have to get pretty far down the list until there's some players showing up that we didn't talk about last week. Yeah, Dalton Connect, one SEC Player of the Year. Zach Eady, Big Ten. Jamal Shedd in uh, Big Twelve. Caleb Love, Pac Twelve. R.J. Davis, ACC. Big East, we don't know. You say Tristan Newton. I say Baylor Shireman. Um, so, any comments about those guys? No, I, I just think that. Uh... The Big East, you can make an argument, is probably they're going to be the – we tried to say it yesterday. I think there's five guys that deserve that – that have a claim to that award. And uh, it's going to be one of those ones where – in a, it's going to be a rare instance where I don't think you can get it wrong. Like, I, I mean, unless they come out of left field and do something crazy, which won't <laughs> happen. Um, but I think you can't get it wrong, which is going to be really fun. Uh, because there's probably, like you said, five guys that can win it. And we're going to see guys who – there's going to be some snubs. People are going to feel snubbed, and that always makes for a good environment in the tournament when these these studs go head-to-head -head and one guy's got a trophy and the other guy doesn't. Yeah, I, di I did feel a little bad for Baylor that he didn't make the uh, final final 15 yeah. of, the, of the Wooden Award um, where Kansas got Kevin McClure and uh, Hunter Dickinson. I, I didn't think uh, – I didn't particularly care for that. Uh, I, I Kansas to me isn't that good of a team to have two players up there. 
Um, and ironically, we'll get to it in the injury updates. Neither will be playing in the Big 12 tournament. Yeah. Um, and the other thing was, I, I love Tyler Kolick, but, you know, as you, we were talking off air, you know, I, I think Tyler Kolick and Oso Igadaro kind of go hand in hand. For sure. And, and, and you, you, you said Stockton Malone, which was a great comparison. And I just feel that Baylor, you could plug him and put him in any kind of system, any kind of team, and he still would thrive where Kolick seems to almost be connected to, you know, yeah. you know. Ba Baylor, I mean, I mean, a testament to Baylor is that he came from a small mid-major, you know, that he didn't come from like a Gonzaga or a San Diego State or a Dayton mid-major that kind of is on that national stage, came from South Dakota, goes to a big brand in Creighton and has asserted himself as, not just one of the best guys on the team, one of the best guys in one of the best conferences, if not the best conference in the country. So I think that, in my opinion, we said this off there, I don't know if you kind of, in my opinion, kind of disqualify yourself if you have another guy on that list. Like, we don't ever see NBA teams go two MVP candidates from one team because are you really the MVP if there's another guy that can claim that title? Probably not. And that's not a knock saying you can't be great and, you know, the best teams – generally have you know two or three kind of 1a 1b situations but uh i mean baylor's had a hell of a year and i i don't know how again you have two kansas guys on there and not have a guy like baylor on there not saying that baylor needs to win it I, i'm not going that far i think we all know who the front runner is um but yeah i think it's a bit it's a bit of a slight again it's like uh for a team that's like if kansas was undefeated going into this Maybe I'd be more, you know, open to it or had, you know, but this is the most vulnerable Kansas has been in a while, at least since self has been at the helm. helm so, yeah, I, I, you know, it's funny because nobody on this show in our season previews or, or anything like that was super high on Kansas. We said from the preseason, by the way, if anybody wants to go back and listen to our preseason previews, I think we did a pretty damn good job with about every conference except for maybe the A-Sun. Um, you know, talking yeah. about players of the year and who was going to yeah. win the conference and who was going to be in the running. Um, uh, I'm, I'm actually very proud of the work. Jake and I did most of it, but some of the other guys uh, chipped into that. But, yeah, I, I hear you. You know, and that's that's a complaint we're going to have moving forward is there, there were some awards, like Coach shared awards, where yeah. you had – a clear best player on a very good team, one of the top teams in the conference. And then you have the team who won the conference who had an, uh, a good player, but not a player of the year type player. And they still yeah. got co-awards and we'll get into that. But uh, guest of the show just recently, great Osborne. What a fun interview. Um, I want to get great back just to talk to him. I mean, he's just, he's just kind of yeah. hard. Um, he won the mountain West now we get to the A-10. Deron Holmes, he's dominated that conference. They're the best team in that conference. Yes, they didn't win the conference. I understand that. But Jordan King on Richmond, I don't quite get that. I mean, Jordan King is a guard, uh, a five-year guard, I believe. Had a really nice season, but doesn't really compare to Deron Holmes in any way. And he wins co-player co of the year. And the thing of it is, if you ask me, you know, as a draft evaluator and just a talent evaluator, they had a player on their team that was probably just as good, just as valuable, and Neil Quinn. Mm -hmm. So Sorry. I don't even know if Jordan King's the best player on his team, let alone the best player in this conference. Yeah. Uh, don't get that one. Uh, Isaiah Coatsart won in the A-Sun. That's that's. He's not the best pro prospect. We talked about that last week. Chad Lanier of North Florida is, but he deserved the award. Then in the American, we have the same thing. Janelle Davis, you know, he should have won it, but he had to share it with Chris Youngblood of South Florida. Again, I don't know if Chris Youngblood is the best player on South Florida, nor do I know. I don't think he's the best NBA prospect on South Florida and just because their team finished first. Now, trust me, I'll, I'm all about giving South Florida flowers. But yeah. come on now. Yeah, I agree. I, I agree. There's just an element of it's like we talked. This is the exact conversation about the WCC award. If South Florida ran away with this conference, if Richmond ran away where it was like, wow, they like dominated everybody. You can get more into that argument. But, you know, you kind of like Colgate didn't in the Patriots. Exactly. Like. 
then it's like okay at some point winning you have to reward winning but we're not it's it's not like south florida i mean they had a great run in their conference but i mean it's it's not like they've dominated all year and there's three guys on that team that all average within a point of each other one or two points scoring wise so there's just like assist wise so it's like you look at the stat line and it's like you kind of pick the name out of a hat from these three potential guys and i think we talked about uh prior being yeah. like a sleeper right. in that right. dark yeah. horse yeah. it's like yeah you pull that out and you're like, John L. Davis is the best player in that conference. John Dude, L. Davis could go be dropped I mean, on any the team only in this other, country. The only other player to me that comes close to him is David Jones of Memphis. Memphis yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's like John L. Davis is the type of guy you can put and play. You can plug him into any roster across the country, and he's no worse than probably the second best player on that team. For most, for the most part, there's a very select few teams. He maybe be the third. Very select few. So it's like. Do the right – I don't know. I'm just a big believer do the right thing. You know, right. do, yeah. do and, the and right thing. Give it to the guy. I'm not, I'm honestly not a big co-award guy in general because, in my opinion, for the most part, there's usually a guy. There's usually a guy. There's a dude who deserves it. Very rare, in my opinion, is there a co – is there a co? Right. There should right. be a co. So you could have had one this year, for example. I think I think you could have had one in the Pac-12. We wouldn't have – Yes. Uh, we wouldn't have argued if KJ Simpson got a piece of that. That was my, that was who I think should have gotten it. Right, and then and then in the Mountain West, you probably could have named you know two or three other guys you know right up there with great who could have you know been. I uh, think Lede. You're right, right, exactly. Yeah. But I don't understand yeah. what's wrong with saying okay, Richmond was the best team in the regular season, um, you know, in that conference and, and South Florida was the best team during the regular season. But you know what? They don't really have any star players. You know, what's wrong There's with that? Nothing wrong with that. There's nothing that's, wrong with that. That's you know? how a lot of teams are constructed. Not Kansas went to the other end of that model. Kansas said, we're bringing in three, four big guns and we're going to ride those horses until the wheel falls off. Other teams are, we are going to have, eight or nine guys that are relatively interchangeable. There'll be two or three that are better because everyone has a, everyone has a best one or two players, but we're going to, we're going to be just more kind of substitution based. We're going to rotate guys in. St. Mary's is like that. St. Mary's on any given night. Is it Mahaney, Marcellonis, Jefferson before he got hurt? Dukas last night hit seven threes. Dukas has games where he has six points. And that works for some teams. So there's nothing wrong with being like, Hey, the best player is this one guy. Now, if FAU completely fell off and, you know, John L. did what he did, but they were horrible, I get it. Mm -hmm. But does any would anyone be shocked if at the end of this, FAU's raising yeah, I, the, the yeah, trophy I still think, and the American? I still think there's a favorite to win the American. I do, you know? too. Exactly. You know, so, so, yeah. So now two friends of our – two friends of the show, Dylan Jones, uh, one in the Big Sky, Drew Pember, one in the Big South. Big West, we didn't talk about much except for A.J. Mitchell, who played on a – highly disappointing Santa Barbara team. It went to uh, Elijah Pepper, who's probably the best player on the second best team in the Big West because Cal Irvine, who kind of dominated that conference, doesn't yep. really have a clear-cut star. Thank you very much, Big West. You did it the right way. <laughs> yep. So, all right. Tyler Thomas, I expressed my disappointment in that one in the Coastal. Uh, Isaiah Crawford, uh, I, I don't know if he had won it at the time, but uh, I said he was, to me, the clear-cut winner. He uh, hadn't won it. That, I, that was one okay, that I So he did win it. That that was good. Trey Townsend won it in Horizon. That, you know, no problem there. Tucker DeVries, um, I don't think that had had that been announced. I'm not yeah. Sure. Uh, had been, yeah, I think it was I think it had been. And no problem there with the, in the Missouri Valley Co Conference. Uh, Riley Minix won it from uh, Moorhead in the Ohio Valley. No problem. Uh, Terrence Edwards, uh, James Madison winning it in the Sun Belt. Eh, I'm not crazy about that one, but I get it. Um, I just recently interviewed uh, Tyon Grant Foster, won it in the WAC for Grand Canyon. And uh, lastly, <laughs> the West Coast Conference, we will say one more time for Drew's pleasure. Augustus Marshall won is one <laughs> for St. Mary's in the West Coast Conference. Which After the show Ryan Nemhard put on last night, man, I'm very excited to see you. Nemhard has gotten the best of Marcelonis pretty badly the last two times they've matched up. So I'm hoping for another Nemhard masterclass. Because I, I actually truly believe that Watson's the most versatile and Nemhard's probably the best player in that conference. Those are probably the two best guys. 
Uh, EK just is kind of there's no one who can really handle him in that conference inside. So I'm hoping for big games from them to to right that ship because yeah, I won't get over it. I I, I won't I get really, over it. I really think the way they snubbed Gonzaga in the awards is they pretty much guaranteed Gonzaga was going to win the conference tournament because those guys have to be miffed. You know, I mean the the sec they literally for those who didn't stay up and watch uh, Jake and I were joking this morning about staying up and watching that game and then watching Mountain West games and all that stuff. Not I don't stay up because on the West Coast, so it's fine for me. But <laughs> um, yeah, no, I mean that game to those who didn't watch was kind of a scary. Was the exact same game as when they beat them at Chase Center. It was a one point. And USF was up most of the first half. Uh, they shot the ball really well. They hit like seven of fourteen threes. Um, but they couldn't put Gonzaga away. And I sat there with my dad, who is a coach. And, you know, my dad asked, like, what are you seeing? And I'm like, if they don't push this to 10 or more, they're going to lose this game because they can't – Gonzaga is just going to keep coming. They're more physical, and they're just more talented. And sure enough, the second half gets going. Gonzaga hits, I think, five of their first six shots. USF starts one to six, blew up a 14-point lead, game was over. Right. And Nemhard was masterful. In his last two games, I think he's up to like 48 points, 22 assists, and one turnover. Nice, nice. All right, so we're going to move on to bracketology. And uh, the way I see this working out, and again, I will warn everyone, I am not a bracketologist. I just play one on a podcast. Um, so the way I'm seeing it right now, 36 teams appear safely in the tournament. Uh, six teams have already earned automatic bids, so that brings us up to 42. There are 16 from one bid conferences who would join the field eventually, uh, so that will bring us up to 58. And then uh, now that includes three teams that I consider to be bubble teams, though most people will say they're not making it unless they win their conference. That would be McNeese State, Princeton, and Grand Canyon. Um, I think McNeese has the least chance to make it as an at-large. I think Princeton and Grand Canyon deserve very serious consideration as much as anybody. Um, and, and I've said this over and over, and I will say it one more time. I, I'd much rather see a Princeton who's only lost three games on the season or a Grand Canyon who's only lost three or four games on the season play in this tournament. And and it's not like they haven't played anybody. They have. They have some good wins on their schedule. Um, I much rather see them than the seventh or eighth best team in some power conference. Um, so uh, if those teams would win their conferences, that would leave us with ten open spots. And right now, I see twenty-seven teams on the bubble. That means only about one in three of the teams I have in green on this chart are going to make it. So I just was wondering, you know, if you look at Lenardi's uh, latest project projections, you know, who do you see, who to you, um, you know, is, where do you, where do you see him being off and, and where do you see him, or, you know, wh where do you have a major problem with it? So I'm looking through his bracket right now. For the, for the most part, I don't think, as I scroll through, I don't see anything too egregious. Um, I think looking at it, some of the seeding I think will be interesting, like the team stay. And I think a lot of this will be sorted out for the tournaments because you have kind of those mid-major teams like a Gonzaga and a St. Mary's that, based on who wins that game tonight, will probably move up and down. Like right now, I believe he has Gonzaga at a six and St. Mary's at a seven. They probably flip-flop based on who wins this game. Um the, the the fight for that one seed is really interesting. I mean, right now he has Purdue, UConn, Houston, Tennessee. Uh, I I agree. I know Tennessee technically lost to Kentucky, but I don't think that loss is enough to bump them down. Even though UNC did win, um, I'm not overly mad at this. I mean, I look at some of the teams, the like the the first teams in, like the last four buys and last four in, and all that stuff. Um. I do agree that I'd like to see some of these more dangerous mid-major teams get in over, like, let's say, a Virginia. I mean, I know Virginia is 22 and 9, so they'll get in based on that. But, like, when Virginia's bad, they're really bad. Oh, yeah. Like, they're really bad. Um, you know, he has on his last four in, he has Colorado. I mean, Colorado, they can just get healthy. They would be a very dangerous team. 
I wouldn't want to deal with them. Um, Indiana State's another one. I know that, like, we've kind of romanticized the, you know, Arch Madness and Indiana State. I do think that they're another team that comes in here and can be very dangerous because I think that offense, if it gets cooking in the right matchup, they can just put up points on anybody at any given time. But I, I'm actually not overly mad at this bracket. Um, I mean, I think once we obviously know by Selection Sunday, we'll get to see a finalized one. But I want to see some of these tournament games play out, see how those go. But uh, to be honest, I'm not overly I'm not overly mad. I don't think he got anything egregiously wrong. Um, I mean, he's got Creighton at a two seed, which I'm actually, personally, I agree with. I, Duke at a three will be interesting. I'm just not high on this Duke team. Like, I think they're set up. I think that Duke team, yeah, they have a three next to them. But I think that's this is a Duke team where I won't go as far as to say we have another Lehigh Mercer situation on our hands, but I could very easily see this team being done by the second, not even making it out of the first weekend, lose the second game, this, depending on who they match up yeah. with. Yeah. Interestingly, uh, and I'm happy to see this, right now he has Indiana State in as an at-large. Yep. I love that. He has South Florida in as yep. winning their tournament. So... I don't know if that's happening. What happens if Florida Atlantic wins that tournament? I would like right. to see South Florida get in just because, as we've, you and I and have been saying for weeks, these teams have changed a lot. You know, new faces, yeah. new everything. And South Florida has clearly been the best team in the American, even over Florida Atlantic, certainly over Memphis. Um, and I think they deserve to get in. Um, uh, yeah. Now he does. He also has uh, Princeton winning winning their conference and getting in, uh, which I think will happen. But what happens if they don't? And the same thing with Grand right. Canyon. What happens if they don't? Um, so the you know the one teams. <laughs> I'm just going to tell you his first. Let me get to so first last four buys: Michigan State, Seton Hall, TCU, Mississippi State. Personally, I at this point. I don't think Michigan State, unless they maybe made the finals, deserves to be in this tournament. This is the team that went 10 and 10 in conference. 10 and 10 in the Big Ten in a very down year for the Big Ten. The Big Ten really yeah. only has two good teams. Okay. Yeah. Northwestern has a has finished ahead of them by two games. Um Wisconsin, I think, finished ahead of them by one game. This team has a losing record against ranked teams. Michigan State should not be given not be given props for playing a difficult schedule. Before you were born, there used to be this boxer named Jerry Quarry. And it seemed like every year he fought Muhammad Ali. Every year he left the ring a bloody pulp. Okay? <laughs> Just because he fought Muhammad Ali doesn't mean he was a good boxer. <laughs> Well, it's interesting. I mean, he has that. He has the Spartans matched up against Florida. That's where he has them as as Florida as a seven, Michigan State as a ten. That game would be incredibly interesting to me. Yeah, because they're both they're both flaky teams. You never know who's going to Michigan. You don't know who's going to show up in Florida. If that game is within single digits with the last two minutes, you have no idea if they're going to be able to close. That would actually be a pretty fun game to watch because there's actually a oh, lot of yeah. talent on those teams. Yeah. But none of it might show up, which could be. Yeah, but I still would hate to see Michigan State yeah. get in. You know, if Michigan State loses in the first or second round of the Big Ten tournament, I would hate to see them get in over Princeton or Grand Canyon or South. Yeah, Florida. no, definitely. Definitely. Um, so the last four he has in is Colorado. I think Colorado's in. I think Colorado deserves to be in. They've played with a lot of guys injured this year. Um, and uh, I, I think they, they're they good enough to be in. Virginia, man, I. I I, don't I just know. don't know. Yeah, I don't I, know what to say about Virginia, but I can see them being in. I have them as a bubble team. St. John's, I now have as in the tournament, so I agree with that. Indiana State, I have as a bubble team, but I'd like to see them in the tournament. First four out, next four out. I'll just combine them all together. A&M, New Mexico, Wake Forest, Villanova, Pittsburgh, Iowa, Providence, Memphis. A&M has done nothing this year, really, to, to impress me. Nothing. Nothing. Yeah. Why, why are they even in consideration? I like New Mexico. I hope they get in. I want Wake Forest to get in. Villanova's been wildly up and down. I don't know what to say yeah. about them. Pittsburgh, I think, deserves to be in. What has Iowa done all year? What the yeah, hell has yeah. Iowa done? I mean, I guess 
I mean, he has them very clearly out. Like they're, you know, they're a team. If you're right. going off their their team, they're the they're the sixth team. Yeah, so they're clearly out. But yeah, I'm like, I haven't thought about Iowa basketball once this year, to be honest. Right. And the only reason the only reason I think Iowa should be under consideration if Caitlin Clark announced she was going to play for the men's team instead of the <laughs> women's team, then that might make them viable. Okay. But other than that, I don't think there's anything deserving about this Iowa team to be in the tournament. And yeah. then Memphis. Memphis hasn't done squat like I, since, Memphis isn't since December. Yeah, Memphis no, hasn't Memphis. done squat since December. I, I mean the only teams in the last are the his like I guess like last eight out or the the first four out next four out that I would like to see in is uh, New Mexico and Wake Forest really yeah I don't have an issue with Pittsburgh but I've seen New Mexico live um, and I think they're a good team I, I I think their ceiling is maybe a win depending on a matchup maybe they could get two but I think that like they're a good team and Wake Forest again is one of those teams that I think if they get in. Could be bounced in the first round, but could also do some damage. I mean, we've seen them. They've been they've been inconsistent, but I lean more towards yeah. they've been inconsistent with no expectations, which is better than having expectations being like a Michigan State. You know, right. like Mich- we. So I, I those are the only two that, to be on here that I would actually be cool with getting in. Everyone else, I either could care less or I actively am like they should not be in this bracket. Right. A couple other teams that I I put firmly in that I hadn't had in last week. I put Boise State firmly in, Nebraska firmly in. Um, let's see. I guess that was about it. They were the two yeah. plus the teams, plus the teams that automatically qualified. Right, like Moorhead and then. Right. So we're going to run down the injuries quickly uh, as we get into championship week here. Uh, and Colorado, who I spoke about having a lot of injuries this season, Cody Williams practiced uh, yesterday. And he, uh, he has a good chance to come back for the Pac-12 tournament. So that's excellent news for Colorado because they've really got to probably win at least one game in the Pac-12 tournament to cement their uh, position. Probably two would definitely do it. Um, so now Hunter Dickinson and Kevin McClure, as we said earlier in the show, are just not going to play in the Big 12 tournament. Um I think that's going to hurt Kansas' seeding. To me, they're, they're, I, I don't know. I mean, are, is this team even a five seed at this point? Um, I, yeah, they're, they're, I think they're, that might be – I would be – as it stands, I know it sounds kind of sacrilege. If I saw them at my – I think he, does Lenardi have them at a four? Or I think he has them at a four. Uh, I just closed the bracket, but I think he has them at a four. I would be pretty happy if I saw them right now. Uh, yeah. Oh, definitely. Now, what do, what do we know about Dickinson? Uh, you know, he separated his shoulder. Now, usually yeah. that's the type of thing that you know you can pop back in, and then you run the risk of it popping back out. But if it doesn't, you'll be okay. But then the more yeah. the more it pops out, the more likely is it is to pop out again until you get surgery. So yeah. that's usually how those things work. But is there any any risk of either of these guys? That, have you heard not playing in March Madness? I haven't heard. I know last time I talked and he made me look silly. McCullough ended up playing in that game. He did? Uh, was it the Houston game? I, McCullough was he played in the Houston game. Oh, I'm almost positive. I didn't even did. watch it. I didn't even watch um, it because I, I thought it was going to be a blowout and it turned and out to it, be a blowout. It was. Uh, I'm almost positive that he played in that game. I'd have to double check it, but uh, I was working during that game, so I didn't get a chance to really follow. But I'm just going to look really quick just to confirm. Yeah, he now he only played 15 minutes. Didn't didn't do any. He had literally zero points, zero rebounds, zero assists, and he only played 15 minutes. So that leads me to believe that it was a. Let me see how I feel. We're getting the crap kicked out of us. You're getting out of this game, right? Um, but do we know anything more about Dickinson's shoulder than what I've? Seen? I haven't heard anything more. Um, right. I would not be shocked with a separated shoulder though if they try to go maximum rest and just prepare for March. And he'll probably um, play with – well, that's what they're saying they're going to do. Yeah. And he'll probably play with a brace in the tournament. And, uh, yeah. yeah. All right. So, no, nothing new on Tyler Kolick. Uh, he's supposed to be reevaluated this week. My guess is he'll play. He's missed the last three games. Uh, yeah. So, so, he's um, – we'll see. But um, – he was. I saw him walking around, and he looked okay. But that obviously walking is a lot different than playing Division One basketball. One of the biggest injuries to pop up this week was was Brendan Carlson, the big center for Utah. Um, he he showed up 
uh, he's now questionable for the Pac-12 tournament. They haven't said what it is, uh, but man, for a team of Utah who went from being in the tournament to being on the bubble to maybe not even being on the bubble at this point or the edge of the bubble for sure, they can't afford to lose their best player. So I don't know what's – I haven't heard anything new there other than he's questionable. Julian Reese didn't play this week. Uh, Maryland's big man with an ankle, and he's questionable for the Big Ten tournament. Rylan Griffith is still questionable for Alabama with a calf injury. Damari Monsanto hasn't played for the last few games for Wake Forest because that knee – has been acting up now. He had a serious knee injury, probably came back sooner than expected, was clearly not 100% when he was out there. He was pretty much limited to just taking catch and, uh, uh, catch and shoot threes. Um, maybe they're just trying to save him for the tournament. I don't know, but right now they're not even – they're still on the bubble. So, But um, that's a shame. Damari Monsanto is one of the best shooters in the country when he's healthy. Uh, Jamal Mashburn didn't play this weekend because of an illness for New Mexico. Uh, he is, uh, I would think he's going to be okay uh, for the uh, Mountain West tournament. We shall see. Nigel Pack uh, uh, missed this weekend's game at uh, Florida State. Uh, and I think that's a knee. A knee. So Miami's been dealing with injuries all year. And this Pack, uh, Wuga Poplar, uh, Matthew Cleveland, uh, even... Uh, uh, Norshad Omir has been was hurt for a game or two, so who knows what's going on with Miami? They lost another one, uh, and they play tonight actually against this Beach. team. Makes me so sad. Yeah, I, yeah. I love this. Like this Miami team, anyone's listened to the show the last couple of years, probably the last at least since Rich and I teamed up, has been one of my favorite teams, like outside of the Zags. And this just really bums me out because I don't know they had a run like they had last year in the chamber, but I definitely thought with. Guys coming back, guys taking the next step, talent wise. I was like, yeah, this team could easily get back to a Sweet Sixteen. Oh yeah, yeah, and, yeah. That's what I was thinking. Sweet Sixteen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, they might be done tonight, um, depending on how they do against Boston College. All right. So now we have Garway Dewall, uh, a a freshman who's been slowly coming along, very talented. Certainly has NBA potential. Uh, he uh, was out this weekend with an with an illness. I think he'll be back for the Big East tournament. Earl Timberlake, uh, former Memphis player, former Miami Hurricane as well, and he's been Mr. Everything for Bryant. He's questionable with a knee injury in the American East tournament. Bryant is probably the team that's the biggest challenger to Vermont, but without Earl Timberlake, they don't have a chance in hell. <laughs> Um, NC State is all of a sudden is all banged up. DJ Horn is doubtful, at least for the first game in the ACC tournament with a hip injury. And Dennis Parker Jr., the best freshman on the team, has already been ruled out with an illness. Must be pretty sick to be ruled out. Um, Oklahoma is also banged up and very squarely on the bubble, if you ask me. John Hughley is is uh, out for at least, I think he's up for the entire Big 12 tournament, but he's at least going to miss the first game. And the same goes for uh, Soares. Uh, is it Ronaldo Soares? He's a transfer from Oregon. Uh, yes. He's kind of been their sixth man this year. He, too, is out. So Oklahoma, all of a sudden, they, they got beat pretty handily by Texas this weekend, and now they're not 100%. All right. So that wraps up the College Notebook. We're going to move on. We're going to talk to Roddy Gale. I actually spoke to him just a few days ago, just before Ohio State played Rutgers this weekend. They won their season finale to continue their hot streak. Uh, and we spoke to Roddy, who's been one of the key players on that team, a uh, four-star freshman, uh, and definitely, you know, one of the best players on this Ohio State team who basically is one short now of 20 wins on the season and one of the hotter teams in the Big Ten. Our special guest today is Ohio State guard Roddy Gale, a former four-star recruit who has emerged as a full-time starter this season. The six-foot-four sophomore is averaging 13.8 points, 4.5 rebounds, and 3.1 assists per game while shooting 45% from the floor and 85% from the free throw line. Welcome to the show, Roddy. How you doing? I'm good. How are you? I am good, and your hair looks great. <laughs> new, new, new do. Um, so I, I'm going to start off with some kind of non-basketball stuff because I noticed you're from Niagara Falls, 
Yes. And then you went to high school in the Washach Mountains. Mm -hmm. And they are two of my favorite places. I, I'm serious. Two of my favorite places in the United States. I, I, I've been to the Niagara Falls I don't, a lot of times for, for a vacation. And um, same for Wasatch to go skiing. So mm -hmm. I have to ask you, being from those places, do you like snow? It's very unique. Um, I don't like being cold, but like growing up my whole life, I, I'm been able to to learn how to get get along with it. Um, it makes places like Columbus a lot easier now that right. it's not as cold. <laughs> don't snow right. as much. Yeah. So how about snowboarding or skiing? You you do any of that? <laughs> oh, that's too reckless for me. I can't. Okay. I can't get along with that. You know, one of our one of our co-hosts of the show. Um, lives in Col Colorado, in the Denver area, he, and he just got a concussion snowboarding. So there that you sounds go. About right. Yeah. <laughs> um, so what do you do for recreation and re relaxation? Hey, man, I, just, I just play basketball. That's like my favorite kind of, you know, uh, whenever I'm down or whatever I ain't got nothing to do, I just pick up a basketball, go, go shoot or something. Okay, cool, cool. That's good. Um, so you come to Ohio State as a highly, highly rated freshman, and from the start, your progression has been steady. You really came on at the end of last season, especially in the Big Ten tournament, and now you're a regular starter, double figure score. Are you happy with your progression? Yes, I am happy with my progression. I feel like um, end of last season, uh, into the Big Ten tournament, even like throughout the summer, I feel like was was a, a test of my like progression to see like how I'd be able to, you know, build off of that run I made at the last year. So I feel like um I can only get better. So right. I feel like um my progression so far has been great. No, no, it's it's a beautiful curve all the way, you know, going steadily climbing. So um, you know, uh this season your assist percentage has more than doubled from last year. Uh, you're handling the ball more in the pick and roll. You're usually the defender at the point of attack. At this point, would you call yourself a combo guard? Yeah, I would call myself a combo guard. Uh, like being, coming into college, like I had to be making this like a staple that my game was going to be a, uh, being a two-way player. Um, so I kind of pride myself into in, in playing defense. Um, I feel like that's just where my, my bread is going to be buttered at. So. Uh, I took. I think I took a huge leap on um, the defensive role um, since my freshman year, and also being able to be in those situations, handling the ball, and um, making reads off pick and rolls. Right, right. Um, so you were you're one of the most explosive drivers in the Big Ten. You got uh, 40 points off dunks this year. You're 20 for 20. Perfect 20 for 20 on dunks. But you're also, you know, just your uh, overall finishing per, uh, percentage is uh, is high. I don't remember the exact numbers. But, uh, you know, you really do like to drive the ball. You can be physical, but you also could be very crafty and nifty with your moves, uh, changes of speed or in, in Euro steps and stuff like that. So uh, at what point in your life did you know that you were special athletically? Um. I say probably my in high school we had a, a a pretty you know intense workout routine like I would I would use the Vertimax and then lift close to six a.m. back at home and then get ready for school and that was just like repetitive every day so gradually I could feel my my explosive getting better and better each day so once I once I seen you know kind of improvements I made with my vertical and even with my speed um, I've been able to like you know. Um, use that to my advantage, whether it's getting downhill or using my explosiveness to go attack the rim. Um, so I would say um, thanks to my high school coach for, you know, keep, you know, working me out on the Vertimax. I think that was a, a huge deal and, you know, who I've become. What, what is the Vertimax? Is that just a program? Is that a routine? It's like, it's like this, it's hard to explain it. It's like this resistant thing. So it's like ties around like your waist or legs and it like pulls you. So it's like resistance. So as I was jumping, uh, doing workouts and stuff, I always had some sort of resistance pulling me ah. away. Okay, that's cool. That's cool. I'm gonna have to Google that. Yeah. Um. So, uh, last year you shot 43 percent from deep, and for your career, you're 84 percent 
free throw shooter. So we know you can shoot, but this year your efficiency has dropped as a as a jump shooter. Is it, can you think of any special reason why that the, why that has happened? Or is it you know the first thing that comes to my mind is you have the number one defensive responsibility taking on the point of attack. Uh, I wondered if that contributed. Mm, yeah, it plays a role, but I think that, um, you know, kind of the role I have this year, you know, teams, you know, switch the defense on me. So, right. um, I feel like, you know, a lot more pressure and, and a lot of different, different uh, techniques have been, you know, applied and just kind of reading the game from me, which I think I've been a, a lot better on. So, I haven't really just looked at, you know, the percentages of like what kind of shots is falling, what kind of shots isn't falling. I just, you know, stay aggressive and try to make it the next one. Right. Okay. Um, in the fall, we spoke with Jamison Battle. And at the time, I believe you guys were a lock to make the tournament. Now, that was before any games were played. Um, you start the season on a 12 2 run. You beat Alabama in there, UCLA, Minnesota, Rutgers. And then you lose the next nine of 11, um, so which culminated with the firing of head coach Chris Holtman. So when that happened, what, what were your emotions? What were you feeling at the time? I would say um, I was feeling sort of, you know, kind of lost, um, kind of looking at, like, what's, what's to happen next. But I feel like as a team, we, we were able to kind of regain that kind of self-consciousness to be able to lean on each other and be able to, you know, Play really hard for uh, Coach Deaver. So um, I think that we will continue and be able to make a good turnaround. Right. And so that was going to be my next question. So J uh, Jake Diebler now takes over as the head coach. Since then, you guys have won four and five, including victories over Purdue and Michigan State. So mm -hmm. what do you think has been the difference? Um, I think we just stayed together, our ability to stay together and uh, play really aggressive for uh, Coach Diebler. Uh, I think his, his ability to relate to every single one of us, like he recruited almost every single one of us. So we have that kind of connection and that respect level to Coach Deaver. So <clears throat> I feel like we just, you know, the ability to go out there and play loose and, you know, play for the guy next to you. Right, right. How would you describe Coach Diebler? Uh, very char uh He's a character. Um, I mean, I love the guy. Like, you know, we go to Bible study a lot. Like he was one of the guys who kind of, you know, pushed me and interested me and be able to uh, increase my relationship with the Lord. Um, he's very energetic. Like you can't, you know, you can't teach stuff like that. Like, and also he, you know, he was one of those guys in college who who was a two way player, kind of like me. You know, kind of dived on the floor, made all that for plays, but also was able to, you know, score uh, at will at Velpo. So having a guy like that who been through it, know what you're experiencing, and also being able to provide energy and opportunities for you in the basketball court is, is amazing. Yeah. I've been I, – I, I, there's something about him just that comes through in the TV screen. I've never met him, but there's something that makes you want to root for him, and I don't know what that is. Um, and he doesn't look much older than you guys, by the way. <laughs> yeah, he jumps in practice sometimes. He, he might – before uh, the coaching change, he would he would play on our scout team. So nice. He was all he was on the court with us all the time. So like it just he just felt like one of, like one of the players, honestly. So kind of that relationship we had with him was, was special. Right. Um. So you finished the season in my neighborhood, uh, at, at Rutgers. Uh, not an easy place to play. Um, and then it's on to the Big Ten tourney. You know, as of now, the bracketologists are not giving the Buckeyes much of a chance to make the NCAA tourney as an at-large team. So that's what my question is about. You know, have you guys at all, coaches, players, talked about what you might, if if there's a path to the tournament without winning the entire Big Ten tournament? Um, we we try to um. Take one, take it one day at a time. Uh, we can't look past records. Like I feel like that's a, a a huge game we must win. So I feel like we need to have all our efforts and energy on onto that game, and we we'll take any game after that as it comes. So just kind of having our mindset focused on the next play, next practice, kind of thing. So we won't get sidetracked from you know where we are. Okay. Um. So you've defeated 
uh, some of the top teams in the country. I, I mentioned, you know, some of them, including Purdue and, and Alabama, who the computers have had as a top five team, you know, since like early on the season. Um, you guys have talent. You have depth. So what do you think the key is to continuing on this hot streak? I think we got to stay together. Um, as we've been through this run, uh, I feel like it's easy for us to kind of look ahead and be like, hey, we're close, but, you know, we're not there yet. Everybody still count us out. Everybody still doubt us. I feel like we got to be able to keep that same mentality we've kept for the past five games, being able to, you know, be the more tougher team, be the more connected team, are some of our vows that we preach every day. So I think if we continue to, to play the way we have, I think we have a great shot. Okay. Um, lastly, I, I wanted to give you a chance to give some love to your teammates. You know, this team features, they've, you've had two great recruiting classes, yours and, and this year's incoming class, and you have some reliable, very reliable veterans, you know, Jameson and, and, and Zed, uh, for example, uh, Dale Bonner. Um, so who has impressed you the most this season? And who do you think might come up big in the Big Ten tourney? Uh, I don't think the Feds have surprised me. Um, we knew Jamison was, was capable of scoring at this clip. Um, Dale, we knew his speed, but he was going to come in off the bench. We knew he was going to be able to be a tempo pusher and really good defensively. So is, is, is that like he a great low post scorer? But I think the person who who impressed me honestly is a uh, Devin Royal right. uh, since the summer. Um, Devin was the kid who was always getting in trouble, always, always not making his sprints, um, stuff like that. Just, just small stuff you see, uh, freshmen, freshmen doing, but as the season progressed, you kind of see him, you know, getting more bought in, being able to be more consistent in his work, in his craft and just being more humble. Um, so I feel like he's, he's a guy that I think we, we definitely need. He, his ability and his efficient efficiently being able to, you know, get on the glass and being able to score easy points has, has been really big for us. I think he, he's a key contributor to where, where we want to go. Yeah, he has stood out of late, you know, I'd say over the last, I'd say while you guys have gotten hot, he's really kind of stood out when he's been on the floor. Um, I want to give you a stat. Um, you probably never heard of this stat because it's only one site out there that, that creates it, that does it. It's real GM, and, and they have this stat called floor impact counter. And basically, it's a measure of overall productivity. It's kind of like almost like a fan, fantasy number. Um, and if your number is 10 or above, it's a good game. And you personally have had 10 or more 10 times this season. The team is nine and one in those games. And the only exception is the three-point loss to Indiana. So, having said that, I wonder if you're the key to the team's success. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I just play my role, man. I just go out there, play hard, um, take open shots, you know? Just just kind of, you know, it's hard to explain. I just go out there and do stuff people don't want to do, you know? Right. Well, no pressure. I'm just... <laughs> <laughs> well, Roddy, it was it was uh, great talking to you, and I want to thank you for joining us today. I wish you and the rest of the team uh, the best for the rest of the season, and please come back and visit us in the future. Excellent. Thank you. Also, I want to tell you, please say hi to Jameson and Zed for me, because they've been on the show in, in previous times. And um, I want to tell you now that Ohio State is now only one behind Nevada. We've had four Nevada players on over, over the three years we've been doing this. Now Ohio State has three, so got to get Bruce or somebody on the show next. <laughs> or you could come back. We'll count you, we'll count you twice. Absolutely. <laughs> all right, buddy. Um, all right, do well, and uh, I'll be watching and rooting for you. And I, actually, I might actually see you at Rutgers this week. I haven't, haven't determined whether I can fit that in my schedule, but if I can, I'm going to shoot down there and see the game. Okay. Sounds good. All right. Thank you, Roddy. Thank you. I saw somebody actually pick Ohio State to win the Big Ten tournament. Well, I thought they were, hot they've been. I thought I thought Ohio State was definitely in this tournament. 
uh, it was definitely going to be in the NCAA tournament. Things certainly didn't go right. Then they fired the coach. And actually, that seems to be right now. It's looking like a brilliant move. Um, so, yeah. So it was great talking to Roddy. Uh, and now we'll move on to the picks of the week. And guess what? Who Guess who's taking over first place? Drew Barton. Drew Barton, the Bay Area Bomber, is now in first place. He went 12-4 and four last week. I went, I put this in wrong. <laughs> I went 11 and five, uh, but I know the totals are right. Uh, so, uh, and Drew now has me, he's at 58.9%. I'm at 58.6. <laughs> now we didn't include our conference tournament picks, but I think Drew's getting me there too. Um, so yeah, we had six, we had six tournaments that are so far over. We both picked Stetson. We were right there. How about the big sky? How about the big sky? All three of the teams that we like to win it, all three of the teams with the conference of the year, player candidate. of the year, candidate, all lost in their first game. <laughs> the only top four seed left is Montana in the big sky. None of our picks. We got we got minus two there because they didn't even make the finals. Um, we were both wrong in the big south. Longwood takes it over High Point and Asheville. High Point was home. How do you lose at home? That I was <laughs> Asheville looked like they did not want to be there, and I know that they the had overtime game, the you day mean, before you mean when they played Longwood. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, the, yeah, the yeah they, they looked like they were out of gas. Like I know they went to overtime the night before, yeah. and I, I woke up to Longwood. watch that Asheville. Longwood game. Went to I, was, I was saying, but Longwood went to overtime, so it's like one team came out firing. I knew that game was over when um, the Asheville. Uh, I draw a blank. It's like Pamper? It, no, not Pember. He didn't have a great game, but um, oh. he's one of their shooter. Uh, I think he's one of the sh his last name's like a a Abby a Amy. I'm drawing a blank on his name. Okay, to be honest, but Go he got tossed. He got tossed out of the game. Oh, and the tech like he and it was like a total like frustration foul. And I was like, they are done. Like they, they could just see it. They're you like watch they're that just... game longer than me because I could just tell that this game was over because uh, Asheville just didn't seem to be there. Zero, um, yeah. One team seemed to be there. One team didn't. High point led by double digits throughout from from yeah. basically from the get go. Uh, yeah. I stopped watching before that happened. I will say today, West Virginia lost in the Big Twelve tournament. You know why they lost? They had a commanding lead in that game. It was somewhere between fourteen and eighteen points over Cincinnati, and they had like three or four technicals in that game. Totally swung momentum. They they gave the game away. And here's the interesting thing, Drew. Cincinnati over the weekend beat West Virginia by nearly 40 points. And I believe West Virginia had a lead by 18 today and they blew it. They had like an 18 point lead with like 12 minutes to go. And then they had these series of technical fouls over nonsense. They gave the game away. Wow. Bob Huggins would be rolling over in his grave if he was dead. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we totally screwed up on the CAA, which is yet to be determined, but we both went with Drexel. They promptly, they were the two seed. They promptly lost in the first game. Uh, Missouri Valley, we both went with Indiana State over Drake. We knew that was going to be close. The game was close. Great game, uh, though. Yeah, great game. Drake ended up winning. Uh, it look, It's looking like your pick of Merrimack, or both of our picks of Merrimack is is looking good so far, but they haven't won yet. Moorhead, you got me there. I took the, I went to Safeway because Little Rock had already advanced to the championship. You picked Moorhead while their game was still going on against Tennessee Martin, and you were right. So uh, you're going to. my boy Riley. Yeah, Minix, you're going to get. NAI legend. Yes. <laughs> and I think that's all the automatic bids. That, oh, no. The other one was uh, Sunbelt. Uh, you went with James Madison. Once again, you were correct. I went with App State. App State lost their first game. And I had been saying that App State should be an at large uh, candidate uh, as a, yeah. as a, as a um, bubble team. But if you can't at least get to the championship game, I kind of crossed them off that list. So yeah. it was close. It was close. Yeah, uh, they didn't get embarrassed, but. No. Yeah, yeah. All right. So now we'll move on to our picks of the week. And uh, we're going to start with the ACC tournament, which I know some of these games have already gone on today. I, yeah. And we have the results. So, so far, 
Uh, Notre Dame beat Georgia Tech. Surprising. They move on to play Wake Forest. And NC State, despite being banged up, beat Louisville. And they move on to play Syracuse. So who do you got in the ACC tournament? I've been a fan of this North Carolina team all year. Um, I had them firmly in my final four a couple of months ago when we did. I didn't do the preseason, so I won't go out and claim that I have them in the preseason, but like kind of a mid-season mark, I had them there. So I'm going to stick with I'm going to stick with them. I think that it's not you know, I, I, this Duke team. They beat them twice. They've had like pretty, pretty handily. So I don't think that Duke's a big threat. I look at the three seed Virginia. You don't know what you're going to get with that team. Uh, Pittsburgh could be interesting. I think Pittsburgh is firmly kind of, I know we have them in that kind of like potential bubble. And they'll, the and they'll most likely in. play Wake. So either either yeah. of those teams could be interesting. Exactly. So I, I think that that path could be, a that could be a good game, whether they, you said they get Pittsburgh or Wake, but I think North Carolina's got too much. I think they're super, obviously super veteran heavy. I mean, everyone, at least, I mean, that starting line has got a bunch of four or five year Guys, uh, the Harrison Ingram transfer has been a match made in heaven, so I'll take the Tar Heels. I like your pick. And and if I had to bet my house on it, I would pick North Carolina. But I'm going to go for a surprise. I'm going to go for multiple points because if you look at my picks, I need to catch up <laughs> to you. I'm going to go with Clemson. I'm going to okay. go with Clemson to win it all because look at this path. They're either playing Miami or Boston College. That's a win for Clemson. Then they play Virginia. I think that's a win for Clemson. And yeah. then they're either playing, uh, they're probably going to play Duke. And I think that's a good chance to be a win for Clemson. So Absolutely. I think they. I think there's a very good chance uh, that Clemson will at least get to the championship game. So I'm going to go with Clemson. So now we're going to go to the American East. And I think this is pretty much a no-brainer. Um, for some reason they don't have, oh, they do have the bracket. All right. So it's only eight teams and we're down to four. We have one seed Vermont. Oh, we're down to two. Yep. They, they the championship is set. Yeah. The championship is the two top seeds. Vermont against UMass Lowell or, or Lowell. Um, so who you got? Vermont. Vermont. Or- Vermont lost one conference game. They've yeah. lost six games all year. I'm taking Vermont. Yes, I am as well. All right, so now we move on to the American, and this tournament is going to be watched for no other reason. Um, I mean, it, it's it's a nice tournament, it's a nice conference, but more importantly, the bubble implications are crazy here. Yeah. So, um, uh, the one seed is Southern Florida. They get a double buy. Uh, the two seeds, Florida Atlantic, they too get a double buy. Actually, all the top four seeds get double buys. Uh, mm-hmm. And that's uh, Southern Florida, Florida Atlantic, Charlotte, and UAB. Notice that Memphis didn't get the bye. I'm going to take Florida Atlantic. I I still think they're the best team here. We mentioned that when we talked about John L. Davis. I know South Florida's you know been kind of the story of the conference. I don't I don't like this Memphis team. They've been a disappointment. They've been kind of a disappointment for a while. Uh, but I still wouldn't really want to deal with them in like a one game elimination situation because there's talent there and they're on South Florida's side of the bracket. So I'm going to take the Owls. Yep. I think you have perfect logic and I agree 100%. The Me- Memphis being on South Florida's side of the bracket is scary. Um, yeah. I'm going with FAU. All right. So now we have the Atlantic 10 where Jake is right now. Um, and we. Had three games there today, so we are now down to 12 teams. The top four seeds get buys, and that is Richmond, Loyola, Chicago, Dayton, and UMass. Yeah, I mean, again, I don't think this is a surprise here. If you people, you know, if you've listened to the show, I've liked Dayton for a while. I had them as my sleeper team last year. The wheels fell off. I'm going to take the Flyers here again. I still think that they're the best team. I mean, this conference was knotted up. I mean, yeah, Loyola, Chicago, and Richmond had the better conference record, but it was by one game. And if you look at the better overall season record, Dayton's been there. And I think Dayton has the best player in the conference and some really, really good surrounding pieces. And if you were going to tell me that um, who was their point guard who got hurt again for the Uh, year to start the year, Malachi Smith was going to be out and they're still rolling. Uh, I'm going to take Dayton. I think this could be kind of like a Deron Holmes legacy thing where he he really puts the team on his back and kind of proves like, hey, no disrespect, but I was the guy. And I should have got that award by myself. Right. You know, 
I'm tempted to take VCU. I think VCU, even though they're fifth in this conference and don't get a bye, I think they're the second best team in this conference. Yeah. From um, what I've seen, I would agree with that. But they got to play. They get. They don't get the bye, so they, they, they should beat Fordham. And then they got to play UMass, should beat UMass. Then they got to play Richmond. Now it's starting to get a little tougher, you know. So they could they could get, get knocked out anywhere along the way. I I I think you know Dayton's for sure is going to get to the Final Four. Loyola will probably give them some problems, but I don't know. Yeah. I I think I have to go with Dayton, but watch out for VCU, folks. Yeah, they gave them a good game the last time they played. It took an overtime. Exactly. Uh, I watched I watched that game and. I, I think from what I've seen in the A-10, I've only seen the top four teams really play. Um, I think VCU is also the second best team in the conference. All right. So now in the uh, Big 12, the top four seeds all get buys. That is Houston, Texas Tech, Iowa State, and Baylor. This should be fun. Uh, we already had two games today. So UCF advanced, beat Oklahoma State pretty handily. They will play BYU uh, tomorrow. In Cincinnati, as I said, had a comeback win over West Virginia, and they will play Kansas tomorrow. Oh, this one's hard because I I believe that the bottom half of this bracket is brutal. Mm. I think that you look at this, and that the bottom half for those listening, it's going to be Kansas, Cincinnati, Texas, Kansas State, right. and then Iowa State and Baylor, and I think that is brutal. The top half. Not to say that they're down, but it's you know Houston. Nope. I think has the easier path there. T- well, TCU, Oklahoma, B- BYU yeah. against a US U- UCF team is playing well. Um, yeah. I mean, this is just yeah. I this, I mean the whole bracket's brutal. I say the bottom half, and the reason I mentioned that is because I'm going to take Baylor. Uh, I like this Baylor team a lot. Earlier in the year, I had mentioned them as my kind of like a, a sneaky. Final Four team, I like them. I think they've got a really nice mix of veteran talent. They've got Jacoby Walter playing at a high level as a freshman. Uh, so I'm going to take them, but part of that's because I just think Kansas, I think they're in trouble. Um, Iowa State's playing really good, but they are young. Um, but like Texas scares me a whole bunch. We talk about them all the time. And again, I just go back to the situation of can Houston generate enough chaos on defense with those injuries with these games coming quicker and quicker against better competition, can they generate enough offense and maintain the defensive intensity? I'm taking Baylor, but this one is probably, along with the Big East, going to be the hardest tournament to pick. I like your pick, especially since I am gonna, I'm going to predict right now Cincinnati beats Kansas tomorrow. Wouldn't be Cincinnati, shocked. Cincinnati knocks Kansas out, so then they would advance to play Baylor. Meanwhile, Iowa State is either going to have to face uh, Kansas State or Texas or Texas, and that's no gimme. Yeah. I'm going to go with Houston. Um, I just think, yeah, I, I just think that lower half of the bracket has too many scary teams in it. Texas, yeah. Iowa State, Baylor. Those are the three. I, I like all three of those teams in that region. Where I look above, and I think the biggest challenge to Houston might be TCU. Yeah. You know? So I'm going to go with Houston. Um. All right, so moving on to the Big Ten. Um, Yeah, I don't know if we're going to have much disagreement here. Top four seeds are Purdue, Northwestern, Illinois, and Nebraska. All have buys. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm going to. Uh, I mean, I think there's literally. I think this is a two horse race. I think this is Purdue and this is Illinois. Um. And, and, and the t- team has played, I think it's played in Indiana this year, I believe. Yeah. yeah. Oh, no. I take that. It's played Minnesota. Oh, yeah. Target Center. Okay. Uh, I mean, this Illinois team wasn't really on my radar. Part of that's just because I didn't fall, you know, early in the season, I wasn't as plugged in. And they've, I've watched them play. Um, I watched their Iowa game the other day. And I, I think this team's really good, but it is. I'm not going to go against Purdue here. I think Purdue is hey. going to win. Um, and set themselves up for hopefully a bit of a revenge tour because they've obviously had a lot of disappointment the last couple of years. So I'll take the Boilermakers. Yeah, I skipped one, by the way. Um, I skipped oh. the Big East. I, I agree. Uh, I think this is going to come down to Purdue, Illinois. I think they're clearly the two best teams. And um, as much as I really do like this Illinois team, I got to favor Purdue. Um, yeah. Oh, I didn't realize I didn't have my camera on. 
I'm so good looking. I'm surprised you didn't complain. <laughs> all right. So, um, all right. So moving right along, uh, we're now uh, to the big East and uh, nobody gets a buy. Well, I mean, you have like three play in games to get down to eight, yeah. um, which will take place on tomorrow. Um, so the top four seeds, of course, are Yukon, Marquette, Creighton, and Seton Hall, because Seton Hall actually had uh, a nice record in this conference, but it's their yeah. out-of-conference that makes them suspect. I'm taking DePaul. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I, I want to see thing. DePaul play Pacific <laughs> in the NIT. I would kill myself. I don't know <laughs> if I could do it. Rich, I watched that game with nine points at the half, and I swear I'm only just getting my vision back, so I can't subject <laughs> myself to that. This one, this is like another one where like I really like this Creighton team. We've been on this Creighton team for the last two years, and rightfully so, with the talent that they've brought in. I think again they're starting to like Ashworth is starting to figure it out and what yep. the role he needs to fill there. And I think that's been a big X factor for them because they brought him in to replace Nemhard, but not to replace Nemhard, if that makes sense. It was a completely different role for him, and he's figuring that out. So Creighton is super dangerous. To be honest, the biggest reason. That I'm going with the Huskies is a. I think they're the best team in basketball, but they don't have to play Marquette. Right. Um, I really right. like Crane. I think I think this. Well, is you know, be... here's the other thing. I mean, Marquette has to play Villanova. Yes. In, yes. In this, well, most likely on Thursday, and yes. Creighton will most likely have to play Providence. And those teams are not. Are those aren't gimme. Those aren't gimmies. Yeah, they aren't gimmies. Where I think yeah. UConn, you know, is probably going to walk all the way to the finals. It's just yeah. can they beat? Creighton or Marquette. So I think you have to go with UConn here, don't you? Yeah. No, I, I agree. I mean, I have them as the best team in college basketball. So right. that already tells you, but I the agree. path is set up for them. I agree with you totally there, too. All right. So now we're moving on to the Big West, a conference where Irvine uh, finished, uh, I believe, three games ahead of the competition. They are the one seed, get a double bye, and UC Davis' two seed also gets a double bye. And our preseason uh, pick, Santa Barbara, is in a play-in game, basically. <laughs> this conference isn't – so I, I watch UC Davis a bit because my dad, a player who played for my dad when my dad was coaching JC, is actually on the bench at UC Davis, doesn't get a lot of burn. So we, we watch and, you know, su support because uh, – shout out to Sam Manu, great kid. But uh, I think UC Irvine is, like, the best team in this conference pretty – by like a, a pretty solid margin. So I'm going to go with Irvine, especially because they get that double buy. Right, right. The only thing I will say is, you know, Long Beach State isn't chopped liver. And, I, you know, no. so they, they could give Irvine a little bit of trouble. Totally. And and I don't know what's wrong with Santa Barbara, but theoretically they should be, you know, they should give somebody On trouble. paper. Yeah, on paper, they yeah. Should, yeah. Yeah, so they On should, paper they should win this thing. Right, right. <laughs> And so they might give uh, Davis some trouble if they even get that far. Well, they might not get that far, but I could see. I gotta agree. Irvine. Irvine's just been too dom dominant, you know, yeah. throughout the regular season. Um, I can see an Irvine Santa Barbara matchup for sure. I could see that, but I think Irvine's just kind of had everyone's number. Right. All right. So now we move on to the Conference USA, which is down to only nine teams this year. Um, believe it or not, the number one seed, we've been talking about Louisiana Tech a lot this season, but the number one seed is Sam Houston. Um, I, I really think it's going to come down to those two teams. I'd say yeah. the sleeper here would be Liberty. Um, uh, yeah, I'm going to go with Louisiana Tech. Because I, I I like their path better. I think Liberty could upset yep. Sam Houston. No, I, I agree. I also think that when you have the player of the year in the conference, uh, these types of games, it's one of the reasons I took Ash, UNC Asheville. And, you know, it didn't pay off in that game. But I'm always more li likely to bet on a player of the year guy. Uh, but that's the type of guy that you're like, okay. And they also, so, as I mentioned before, they also have Daniel Bacho. I was just going to say Bacho is averaging a 15-point double-double and shooting right. like 60% from the field. He's right. been like a force inside. So yeah, in they, have a, they have that big, they have like a legitimate big, and they have the players. Like I just think that they have guys. They have enough dudes to get them over the hump. So They I have will... two guys who could be – well, actually, Bacho has started – at the power right. six level. And I think Isaiah Crawford could start at the power six level and do well as well. All right. Sure. So now we're down to the Ivy, which makes which makes 
things simple for everyone. They cut the conference in half. Clearly, this conference was a three-team race all season between Princeton, Yale, and Cornell. And ultimately, Princeton came out on top. I've seen three of the four play. I haven't seen Brown play. Brown is the fourth team in. Brown was a team that I actually predicted was going to be in the Final Four. In fact, the four teams that I picked that would finish in the Final Four of this conference are here. Uh, but I favored Yale at the time. Now I favor Princeton. Yeah, I, I think this is going to be one, two. Uh, I've seen Yale play because they came out of the West and did a little bit of a West road trip out here. So I saw them play twice very early in the year, though. So obviously things have changed. I think the research I've done, Princeton, to me, is the better overall team. I know the conference record are, is close within a game, but, like, the year-long record tells me I looked at the number, Princeton's the better team. But I think Yale-Princeton's a good game, though. It will be yeah, interesting well. that you mentioned, though, if Princeton gets knocked well, out. Don't be, don't be surprised if Cornell is the one that emerges yeah. there. I mean, they, they're they right there, too. Yeah, um, but it would be interesting to see if, if Princeton doesn't get the auto bit, like you said, do they have enough of a resume with 24-3, and 12-2 and two conference record to, to still get in? That, I think, can get a little bit interesting. I think if they lose the championship game in, like, overtime or by, you know, one possession, I think people should give them real, real serious con- – and if you look at this roster, compare it to last year's roster, you will see the team that made Sweet 16 last year, you will know that this team is as good, at least as good as last year's team. All right, so we're moving on to the MAC, not the Mid-American Conference, but the M. AAC conference, which would be held in Atlantic City. Um, I think that's kind of their permanent home now. Uh, they've been there for a few years. Uh, t- top seed is Quinnipiac. Second seed is Fairfield. They've been kind of like nip and tuck all season. Um, yeah. Who you got? Oh, I'm not very familiar with this conference. Well, let me put um, Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, uh, yeah. Ooh. For the sake of the chaos that's been going on, I'll take the two seed Fairfield, but that's more just because you don't want to chalk every single one of these things and just take the one. Right. I'm not very familiar though, to be honest. I'll take Fairfield just to mix it up a little bit. All righty. I'm gonna take Quinnipiac because uh I don't know how many interns we've had over the years, but uh, <laughs> I, I don't know. I'm gonna say twenty or thirty uh over the you know, since we started in when did we start? 2017, 18? And uh at least half of our interns have come from Quinne- Quinnipiac, an excellent communication school for those who want to become sports reporters or journalists, sport, um, excellent school, or even communications. They put people on TV as well. They're kind of like Syracuse Minor uh, here in the East Coast. All right, so now we'll go to what is typically known as the MAC, the Mid-American Conference, uh, and they get started uh, tonight, I believe. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, tonight. And so the uh, there is no buys, uh, but the top seed is Toledo. The second seed is Akron. Uh, those two teams have been neck and neck all year. Uh, I'm going to go with Akron. I looked at their numbers earlier. Oh, they're kind of more of the more advanced metric sites, and they do all, for the most part, favor Akron. This is, I'll be honest, another right. conference I haven't watched. Yeah. Um, I think of. they split during the, the regular season, and, and yes. of course, Dante Maddox is going to be uh, uh, the uh, scoring guard uh, for Toledo, is going to be on the show in the future. I think it's pretty it's pretty close toss-up. I'll go with Toledo and our friend Dante Maddox. Be nice to have a conference champion on the show. All right. So we're we're getting down there. We only have a few more conferences to pick. Now we have the MEAC. Um and the again only eight teams. Uh North Folks, the Norfolk State is the one seed. Uh UNC Central is the two seed. Uh sorry I gotta pull up the bracket here. So Norfolk. I'm going to go with Nor- Norfolk here. So am I. So am I. Um, yeah. Been the better team during regular season. I must admit, I don't know a lot about them. Um, so I'm going to go with Norfolk. All right. Now, a conference I do know a lot about, and it may arguably the most fun conference this year. Oh, man. Um, we have the Mountain West Conference. So one seed, Utah State. Two <laughs> seed, Nevada. Three seed, Boise State. Four seed, UNLV. 
five seed San Diego State, and what Colorado State, believe it or not, is a seven seed um, behind New Mexico, and New Mexico and Colorado State each have to play an extra game. This is really tough. Uh, and this yeah. tournament, by the way, is in Vegas, um, so at UNLV's home court. Uh, yeah. Unless it traditionally helped a hell of a lot in the past, but yeah, I know. Oh man, I... I'm going to take Nevada, but this is a mm... ah, man. <laughs> oh man, no, I, I... Uh, this is brutal. There, 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 I mean, this is brutal. There's literally no easy path. But, like every every single per. Boise State is likely going to get New Mexico. Nevada is probably going to get Colorado State. San Diego has to play UNLV in UNLV. Utah State, while they have the easiest first game, will yeah. they need to have to play San Diego State? Or UNLV argue, at their place. Yeah, or UNLV at their place. Like, they, there is no easy path whatsoever. Um, but yeah. with all that being said, I'm going to I'm going to take Nevada. This Nevada team is, is super good. I think that Colorado State is – a good team, but I don't think they're great. Yeah, if there was uh, one of those teams, you know, that that they've been saying is it was the in, they're in, they're in, they're in, that I think maybe shouldn't be so securely in, to me it's Colorado State. Yeah, and I, I do think that Utah State having to play most likely one of either UNLV or San Diego State, like San Diego State is, could very easily win this whole thing and remind everyone that they're kind of traditionally the best team in this conference. UNLV has been one of those teams that they literally can beat anybody. They beat Creighton earlier this year pretty handily. They almost beat St. Mary's. They're obviously a four seed. So I'm going to take Nevada because it's while it's not a home game, it's still relatively – They I'm sure they'll have some local support. And they and I and, just – And they just won – they just won on the – I think it was a road game again. I think they just beat – I know yeah. they beat UNLV this weekend. I'm just trying to figure out wh whether it was on the road or not. Um, but anyway, they've done well on the road this year. Yeah. I, I, I like Nevada. All right, so now we're down to the Pac-12 conference, um, which we said if Arizona would somehow lose uh, in this tournament, it's going to be total chaos. And then – a day after we said that, Arizona went out and lost to USC for the season finale. And who might they play in their first game? Arizona. Now, of course, Arizona, Oregon, Washington State, Colorado all get buys. And Arizona is either going to play the winner of Washington, is going to play the winner of Washington, USC. So they could face USC all over again. Yeah, I, I've had a really hard time trusting this Arizona team. Um, I'm going to take a flyer here and I'm going to take Colorado. You are stealing my thunder today, boy. <laughs> I, I, I just think that, <laughs> and I, I think we all agree on this, Colorado is, no, I won't say they're as talented as Arizona, but they're right, they're like right yeah, there. They're right there, and yeah. If they can just get healthy yeah. and stay healthy. I mean, playing yeah. Washington State is tough, but I think Washington State's a little bit more of, like, a feel-good. Like, you know, they've kind of righted things. Not that they're not good, mm -hmm. but, like, Arizona is liable, as they have been, to, to – we just saw them get handled by USC. I would still take Arizona over USC. I just think that if Colorado can figure it out, they are super dangerous. And in Arizona-Colorado match, I could see Colorado pulling it out. So I'm going to take the buff. The yeah, yeah, I, I, um, yeah. So that would be now. I have to decide. You know, I, I think it's going to be interesting if USC plays Arizona because you know, totally. to me, Arizona had all the motivation in the world to win that game to stay, you know, to fight back for the one line, you know, and USC led that game from start to finish. So, what if USC beats Arizona again? Then. Then it comes down to USC and Oregon in the top half, and most likely Washington State, Colorado in the in the bottom half. And who do you like out of those four teams? Well, I like Colorado. I like Colorado. Um, yeah, I I was gonna I wanted to pick chaos in the Pac-12 because I so I'm gonna go with Colorado. All right, so now, but uh, of course Arizona is the favorite, so 
for those who are betting or whatever. So now we move on to the SEC and the top four teams there get buys, and that's Tennessee, Auburn, Kentucky, Alabama, and the dregs of the conference who have to basically play in games uh, are Arkansas and Vandy uh, and Georgia and Missouri. And I'll tell you what, Arkansas is playing kind of like we expected them to. So they are a team to be, to be wary of. Yeah. I really like this Tennessee team. I'm going to take them. Part of my reasoning there is because you look again, this is another one. You look at the bottom half of that bracket and you're like, Florida has been in a lot of these games and at any point can beat anybody. They can figure it out. I I don't know why. I mean, the computers and everybody loves Alabama. I just I don't think they're bad, but like I, I'm just not super high on Alabama train, but they do have talent. And like Texas AM, yeah, Old I, Miss. But I also think Alabama might not even get to the final four because Florida could beat them. Exactly. So I'm, I'm going to go with Tennessee because I think Tennessee is the best team. And looking at their half, the only team there that kind of scares me is Auburn. But I think Tennessee is better than Auburn. I look at the bottom and I'm like, I could see Kentucky, Alabama, or Florida making a run there and getting to like a finals appearance. I'm going to go with Kentucky. Um, I, I think that uh, Tennessee should be able to handle their first game, though Mississippi State could give them some trouble. Uh, but then they have to play Auburn. I, I think Auburn could definitely beat them. I, I, I like Kentucky to definitely advance to the Final Four. And I like Kentucky. I think they're better than Alabama or Florida. Who I don't, but I don't know who they're going to be playing. They're going to be playing one of those yeah. two teams. But I definitely like Kentucky over those teams. So I actually think Kentucky has the easiest path here. And I think when it comes to Kentucky and Tennessee, as we saw this weekend, that's pretty tight now. You know? Yeah. It, so I'm gonna Kentucky's go with Kentucky. playing at a very high level, like no yeah. doubt. They've they've like kind of. It's funny enough. Ever since they lost to Gonzaga, they've kind of righted that ship. I just still have the question of like if they revert back to like the the all offense, no limited defense. I wouldn't say no defense because they do have athletes. They do have guys who can make plays on defense. But the all offense, you know, limited defense always scares me a little bit, especially when you're young. Um, where I look at this Tennessee team, they're kind of the flip of that, where it's, they're, they're more defensive focused, but now they have Dalton Connect who can spark an offense by himself, and they're just more on the veteran side. But I, I would love to see a round three between Kentucky and Tennessee. I think that would be an awesome battle of the two best teams in the SEC. Yeah, that, that might be the best conference championship out there. Yes, Tennessee for sure. All right, so now we move on to one of the worst conferences in basketball, yeah. and that's the SWAC. Uh, number one seed, Grambling. Um, nobody gets a buy here, only eight teams. Uh, the two seed is Alcorn State, three seed Texas Southern, four seed Southern. Um, and I am going to pick Southern just because I know the computers slightly like them in this conference. And that probably means that they lost to Texas by like 15, um, where <laughs> where everybody else lost to a similar team by 20. I have no idea who to pick here. If I'm being <laughs> completely honest, like I have very I have no idea who to pick here. Um Just for the sake of it, I'll take uh, I'll take Alcorn just to not I take I have no idea I'm not versed in this conference whatsoever, and I look at these records and I'd say Alcorn has the best history historically uh, as as a basketball team, but none of them none of them are anything to write home about. Yeah, so, I'll, I'll take Alcorn. <laughs> so now we finish with the WAC conference. Uh, Pretty much Grand Canyon has run away with this, but, you know, not too bad. Tarleton only finished one game behind, but everybody else was at least four games behind. However, Tarleton is not eligible for the NCAA tournament. Yeah. So Grand Canyon, by the way, and Tarleton both get double buys. If Tarleton makes the finals and they would win it, whoever they beat would go to the NCAA tournament. So Grand Canyon has to get if Grand Canyon yeah, gets won. to the finals and loses a Tarleton, they'll still be in. I'm going to take Grand Canyon. I think Grand Canyon has been the best team here. Um, you know, I, I, I do think Tarleton has been pretty, pretty good, but I think there's an element to it. Like Grand Canyon really has something to play for. Like they, they need to win a game to get to the championship because they get there and yeah. their odds increase dramatically. And, and they'll be rooting like hell for Tarleton to get in, which is exactly. take all the pressure off that championship game. Exactly. So I, I'm I'm going to take Grand Canyon. I think they have the best player in the conference. It's 
they're in a situation where they're going to hopefully they're going to get a pretty favorable draw. So take that. All, right. all right. So that wraps up our championship week picks. As always, I want to thank all of our listeners and I want to thank our special guest, Roddy Gale for joining us. If you ever miss this episode, you can c- get caught up on hoopsprospects.com. Also, if you'd like to send us a question for the mailbag, and I know we haven't been, we haven't even looked at the email lately because we've had so much to get on with, with interviews and special shows because we're in the middle of March Madness. But definitely uh, once March Madness comes down, we'll be taking questions on draft prospects and NBA stuff. A lot of times we get a lot of NBA questions, actually. Um, so you can send them to admin, A-D-M-I-N, at hoopsprospects.com, or we take questions on social media via uh, Twitter, at Hoops Prospects, on Instagram, at The Hoops Prospects, and on Facebook, at Hoops Pros. We will be back next week, next Tuesday, which we hope to get up Wednesday morning, Um and we will have our bracket selection show. So that won't include the four, first four games. We won't be making predictions. Right. Well, we will be making predictions for them, but a couple of the, those games will be played by the time the episode is up. But we're focusing on the 64 teams. And we'll, just like last year, we had, um, did UConn? UConn wasn't in our collective bracket, was it? Because I was outvoted. Mm. I was outvoted. Yeah, I think it was Houston. Yeah. Um, so I had, I definitely had the uh, winning bracket amongst our, we have a pool amongst all of our writers and former interns and all that good stuff. Uh, so I had the winning bracket last week, last year, folks. So you want to tune in for that. Uh, I think I took second for what it's worth. And right now you're beating think... me on the, you're beating <laughs> me on picks of the week. So you, 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 right now you're the man. Uh, but anyway, we'll be picking a bracket and previewing the whole tournament next week, folks. So make sure to cho- uh, yeah, tune in for that. Drew, any final thoughts? I'm going to go watch my guys. Hopefully pull this one out. We got to win. Zag's got to get this one. Cause I can't fucking stay. Stan St. Mary's. <laughs> Even though I might be worried. Wow. <laughs> I just, their brand of basketball just doesn't really do it for yeah, me. I'm not, I think, I'm not uh, to be that. honest, and this is like the conspiracy theorist fandom, I think they benefit not just because the WCC is not good, but official and WCC are historically not great. And so they're able to play that brand to the extreme of like kind of physical, bullyish basketball because these refs don't really know what they're doing. Like, they don't know how to officiate those higher levels. They, they can officiate Pepperdine versus Portland. But but when you get to, like, that level of physicality matched with NBA potential guys and, like, the Zag- I think they get way over their head. I think that's what happened when they played at Gonzaga. Those refs lost control of that game and, to be honest, had no idea what they were doing. Like, completely, the last 10 minutes of that game, they were just – I mean, they would literally blow a whistle. One guy like, block. The other guy's like, charge. And they'd be like – can we call both at the same time? And you're like, no, you really can't. Like, pick one. So, got to go watch my guys hopefully win this thing. Enjoy it. Enjoy it. Uh, I, I will oh, say be, that we I'm will be, be talking. Insane. I think once the season's over, we'll be talking about what we think basketball needs to do and uh, separate itself from football. And <laughs> no, no, I, I, yeah, I, no, I, I know. mean that. I mean, football, 100%. If, if football well, wants to have all these crazy conferences, but I think basketball has to come back to some sanity. And I think part of that might be uh, Gonzaga St. Mary's moving on to the Mountain West, informing, amen, brother, informing an all sports conference, um, you know, for for every sport but football. Um, and uh, the, the other the teams, West. the other teams could find homes in the Big West, in the Big Sky, in the Summit, more their, more in the WAC, speed. in the WAC. Yeah, where they'd be more relevant. Yeah, yeah. U- USF and Santa Clara would be really fun in those conferences because it would it it would be more their speed. They'd have chances. USF yeah. would go to a lot of those conferences and be the favorite. Um, and they would fit right in with Irvine and 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 you know UCSB yeah. and all that. So and yeah. Santa and and you and Gonzaga and St. Mary's in the Mountain West would make the Mountain West arguably the deepest. You could make an argument the deepest conference relative to the talent that's in it. I mean, you add those two to that mix. Now you're talking about Colorado State being a nine seed. Not a lot of tournaments have a nine seed that would be like a Colorado State. So I think that'd be really good for all parties involved. I, I 100% agree. All right. 
All right. We'll see you next week. And we're all going to be on the road. So uh, I'm going to try to report from the uh, from the championship tournaments uh, on social media, at least. So look for that, folks. Maybe even, Jake, if we can hook up, maybe we'll even do a special broadcast, right? Right from Madison Square Garden. How cool would that be? That'd be pretty cool. Like a nice little vlog kind of episode. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That'd be cool. All right, Rich. I'm off. Talk Talk to you. Again, All right. Bye-bye.